Okay, we're back after a short hiatus with the last couple of parts of Lecture 10. Um, you may have noticed that the ant carotenoids has morphed into ant vampire bats. Uh, this lecture was first done about three years ago for a regional Royal Society of Chemistry event. Looking at it again has produced some evolution in the content. So carotenoids and epigenetics have been shoved aside, at least temporarily. I will do a couple of short videos on these topics uh, reasonably soonish. Before we go on, a call back to the ever quotable Albert St. George, with another quote I came across recently. Um, when he isolated the white crystals we now know as ascorbic acid, he didn't know what he had, uh, so he called them ignos. That's the Latin for I don't know. Well, but he's such a wag. Um, okay. A reminder of the biochemical pathway to vitamin C. Uh, for simplicity, I'm going to mostly say vitamin C, but be aware that literature will talk about ascorbic acid or ascorbate. Um, here's the pathway. Uh, the gene that expresses l galonolactone is switched off in humans and other species. So this final step can't be carried out, and so we can't make our own vitamin C. One question that might spring to mind is, what's the point of this longish pathway leading to an impossible final step? Well, although the series of reactions described in the pathway is well established, remember the pathways can run backwards, and they are linked to other pathways by shared intermediates. Um, so the product of the first reaction here, 6-glucose-6-phosphate, is also the product of the first reaction of glycolysis, the pathway by which we degrade 6-carbon sugars. Uh, on the other hand, it's the uh, intermediate and final step of gluconeogenesis, the flip side of glycolysis. Um, this is true of all of the intermediate and the truncated pathway to vitamin C. Biochemical pathways intersect in complicated ways, the details of which we're only really starting to understand. Okay, this is said to be a pseudogene. Uh, a pseudogene is a genomic DNA sequence similar to normal genes, but non-functional regarded as defunct relatives in functional genes. In this case, the pseudogene for Gullo is on chromosome 8. Um, want to see more? Check on the website there, which has got lots of information on pseudogenes. Evolution isn't a random process. Genetic variation is random, but selection is not. If a mutation provides an, org an organism with an advantage in its environment, then that mutation is much more likely to pass on to future generations. So, it's reasonable to assume that deactivation of the Gullo gene provides a benefit to species that carry this mutation. Um, amusing though this image is, it does fairly accurately represent something that happened in the developed world in the last 20 to 30 years. We have moved on from uh, having a largely manual workforce to one that's much less active. Um, the consequences of this have yet to play out. Okay, it's not just us. Uh, Reminded, it isn't just the anthropoid apes, including humans that can't synthesize vitamin C. Uh, the passeriform birds, uh, more than half of bird species, small perching birds. Uh, the type species is the house sparrow, the humble spuggy. Uh, a type species is the species that best exemplifies the essential characteristics of the genus to which it belongs. In this case, these are birds that are small, they perch, and they uh, engage in song. Uh, something a bit less charming, uh, lampreys. Lampreys are charmless, jawless fish that have a toothed ring-like mouth that can be used to bore into the flesh of other fish in order to suck their blood. Um, the sea lamprey is one of this bunch. Um, the outlook is not so good for their hosts, who often die from blood loss or infections. Morio and Dabrowski reported this species produces gullolactin oxidase. Um, they are one of the most ancient groups of fishes, having evolved about 420 million years ago. Um, the authors noted that the blood of their unfortunate victims was low in ascorbic acid, so it's unlikely to be a major source compared to that produced endogenously in the lamprey's kidneys. Uh, Fruiting bats, another group that have lost the ability to synthesize vitamin C, uh, given their diet contains a lot of this vitamin, that would seem reasonable. What about bats that don't eat fruit? such as vampire bats. Um, I've not been able to track down a confirmation of this, but I seem to remember reading somewhere that they can produce endogenous vitamin C. If anyone can confirm or deny this, please let me know. Uh, 
On the subject of lost biochemical abilities, Vampire Bats, it turns out, can taste umami or sweet flavours. Um, that's their diet. Um, doesn't really need them to do so. Um, here's an irrelevant but cool factoid. Draculin, I wonder how, why that was named that, is the glycoprotein found in the saliva of vampire bats. It functions as an anticoagulant, keeping the blood of the bitten victim from clotting while the bat was drinking. Uh, there have been attempts to develop anticoagulant drugs from Draculin, but none have yet made it in the market. Yeah, why did we lose the ability to produce vitamin C? And what advantages does it give us? There's a number of theories, um, some with harder to test than the others, and some with perhaps a little bit more uh, academic rigour behind them. There's a lot of fruit about, and much of it comes from Africa. It's pretty clear that our ancestors would have had a good access to dietary sources of vitamin C. Um, and there's a variety of African fruits, including the miracle fruit. Uh, a couple of weeks before writing this, I asked for volunteers from my second year uh, human metabolism group to try tablets made from miracle fruit. A few minutes later, they were all happily munching on lemon slices um, without going to uh, Miracle fruit contains a taste-modifying protein that blocks the tongue's bitterness receptors for an hour or so. Uh, this brought the sweetness of lemons out. It still tastes a bit sour due to hydrogenines from the fruit acids. Um, the sour taste uses iron channels rather than G protein, so he's unaffected by the miracle fruit. So, something for first years to look forward to. We're doing human metabolism next year. Um, okay, it's a bit hard to be clear what the diet of our distant ancestors consisted of. However, Paleolithic nutrient intakes have been estimated by a number of authors. Estimates suggest that the Paleolithic diet contained much more vitamin C and other plant derived oxidants. Um, this was about the time of the earliest occupation of Britain by humans, about 800,000 years ago. Uh, they share the landscape with many species of large mammals, and we'll have a little bit more in the Paleolithic di diet in a bit. Linus Pauling suggested the mutation in an inactivated gullo may have had a survival value, because it freed biochemical systems to carry out other reactions, and so saved energy. When our hominid ancestors left the trees and migrated in more temperate climates, this advantage was lost. Uh, which does beg a large question. What was the evolutionary advantage of losing the ability to synthesize such a crucial enzyme? On the face of it, individuals who lost this enzyme would seem to be rather less adaptive for survival in an environment where vitamin C sources were less abundant. Uh, and so would be expected to be less able to have descendants who would carry this mutation. Well, here we are. We seem to be doing quite all right, okay. Um, a little bit worried about Lance Powling. Uh, Powling's influence in chemistry was enormous. His work ranged from the study of biological molecules and molecular genetics to the nature of the atomic nucleus. He was probably most famous for his 1939 book on the nature of the chemical bond, possibly the most influential chemistry book ever published. Uh, a summary of work in this area. Uh, and is the basis of our modern understanding of uh, chemical bonding. He was awarded the Nobel in 93rd Prize for Chemistry in 1954 for his research in the nature of the chemical bond and its application to the elucidation of the structure of complex substances. He is also the only person who received two undivided Nobel Prizes. Um, his work in the effects of nuclear fallout on biological molecules led him to campaign actively against nuclear weapons. In the wake of the McCarthyite witch hunts of the 1950s and early 60s, this led to accusations of him being a communist, uh, allegations which he categorically denied. In 1958, he presented the UN with a petition signed by 9,000 scientists calling for an end to nuclear testing. This was the same year as he published the book No More War, in which he argued not only against nuclear weapons, but against war itself. The Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, outlawing all but underground nuclear testing, was signed in July 1963 and went into effect on October the 10th, 1963, the same day in which the Nobel, Norwegian Nobel Prize Committee announced the Peace Prize in the year 1962 was to be awarded to Linus Powell. In his later years, Pauling spent much of his time extolling the benefits of high doses of vitamin C. 
He was introduced to this idea by the biochemist Erwin Stone, of whom more in a moment. Pollen took three grams of vitamin C a day in order to ward off the common cold. In the 1970s, he collaborated with British surgeon Ewan Cameron uh, on the use of intravenous and oral vitamin C as a cancer therapy for terminal patients. To date, there's no compelling evidence of the benefits of vitamin C megadoses on preventing colds, and clinical trials fail to find an effect with cancer patients. Uh, it's perhaps sad that Pauling's great contributions have been somewhat overshadowed by the vitamin C controversy. The link above is typical of the criticisms of Pauling are found online. It grudgingly acknowledges that he contributed greatly to the development of chemical theories before going to say his impact on the health marketplace, however, was anything but laudable. As mentioned earlier, Erwin Stone was responsible in large part for Pauling's later fascination with vitamin C. Uh, on the occasion of his receipt of the Carl Newberg Medal in 1966 in New York City, Pauling lectures on science and world problems. On April 4th, he receives a letter from Erwin Stone, who was struck by Pauling's mention in talk uh, that he would like to live for another 15 years. Stone wants Pauling to live even longer than that, and he believes as a, he has a way to accomplish that a high-level regime of vitamin C. Um, Stone sends Erwin some material about his medical ideas and Pauling and his wife begin taking large doses of vitamin C. They experience an improvement in health and a decrease in the number of, and severity of their colds. Um, so Stone's letter marks the fascination, uh, beginning of, I beg your pardon, beginning of Pauling's fascination with ascorbic acid and its role in human health. Okay, um, Moving on to urban stone and the primate fertility factor. Rabbits and foxes is a classic predator and, play mod predator and prey model. Uh, the size of the population of each group is constrained by the population of the other group. If, for example, a lot of foxes, they rapidly eat most of the rabbits, leading to a fox population crash. Humans, on the other hand, have few constraints to population growth, uh, especially in the past few hundred years. The Black Death between 1348 and 1350 caused the population to fall for a while. Ever since then, its rise has been inexorable. Even the two world wars of the 20th century only slowed the rate of population growth. Right, okay, this distressingly cheerful family photo is courtesy of Microsoft Clipart, which I apologise. The older we get, the more vitamin C we need, and the elderly need the most. It's maybe linked to oxi oxidative stress, of which more in a minute. Uh, the higher amounts for young children may reflect a necess necessity to provide a margin of safety. So the argument is that the lost, uh, loss of the ability to produce endogenous vitamin C has allowed it to affect as, act as a fertility factor in primate populations. The need for vitamin C increases with age, so in times of food shortages, Older members of the population die at a higher rate than younger members. This reduces the median age of the population of ones are younger and more fertile members, and so enables the population to regrow rapidly when food sources recover. Um, Stone had great difficulty getting his views more widely known. After he retired, he concentrated his efforts on his vitamin C theory. His book, The Healing Fact of Vitamin C Against Disease, was produced in 1972. Uh, both Pauling and Albert St. George wrote forwards of the healing factor. Uh, as you can see, Pauling was very enthusiastic. Albert was almost as keen, but uh, perhaps in a little more roundabout ways. Um, mentioned the fact that it's good for spraying trees with. In a nutshell, these are the arguments for the fertility factor. The increased need for vitamin C in the elderly produced a greater mortality in that group, so re releasing resources for the young. We can manage with suboptimal amounts of vitamin C and recover rapidly when supplies improve. Any serious supply issues would impact disproportionately on older individuals compared to younger ones. Okay, Erwin Stone's day job. Um, Stone was a biochemist and a chemical engineer. In 1934, he became director of the Enzyme and Fermentation Research Laboratory for the Wallenstein Company a large manufacturer of industrial enzymes. He was interested in the antioxidant properties of the recently discovered vitamin C, which he used as preservative for foodstuffs. He was granted the first 
three patent applications on the industrial use of vitamin C in 1938 and 1940. Um, food rot is part of the natural process involving the enzyme polyphenol oxidase. It's caused big economic losses during transport and storage. Um, the PPO enzyme can be inhibited by spraying the fruit with dilute vitamin C or some other fruit acids. Um, recently, supermarkets have introduced packs of mixed sliced fruits. Uh, remarkably, a couple of days after reopening, the fruit remains unblemished. This is probably because it's been sprayed with a fruit acid solution, most likely because it's cheapest citric acid. Okay, thanks for listening. Uh, the next video will look at some of the other theories, some quite wild and seemingly wacky, about why the higher primates lost the ability to synthesize vitamin C. So, back in a little bit.